Good morning or good afternoon everybody. Welcome back to the second installment in this rather involved layout design project. If you're watching last time, you may recall that I left you with this view of the main deck of the layout. At this point, the basic footprint has pretty much reached its final form, although there are a few more changes that took place after this. Let's talk about one of them now as we start to get into the detailed design. Here is the upper deck plan that I showed you in the previous video. And if we look at the raised walkway, we'll see that it just ends in a flight of stairs. And this I didn't like because we could have operators more concerned with where the train is than where they're walking, and they could easily walk off the end. So what I wanted was an arrangement that would stop that from happening. So let's go to another view quickly. This is not the next plan drawn, but it's one that shows what I wanted to demonstrate. Ignore these three white bars for the time being. Notice how I've widened the end of the platform considerably and put the stairs in the middle. This means that people operating in the yard will just walk down here missing the stairs. People operating this side will tend to follow the benchwork edge and also miss the stairs. I've drawn railings around the critical areas and then this area at the top of the stairs there isn't really any reason for anybody to be stood there while operating trains. They'll either be one side or the other. Now this makes this area quite cramped but it also makes it safe. And we talked about various other ways of doing it. Customers suggested some kind of moving tray that slides over the stairs. We couldn't come up with a good way to make that work reliably, so we just went with this version. Now, unfortunately, it does take up quite a bit of space because we've now got effectively three aisles side by side, stairs in the middle and two operating spaces on the side of it. So they're all somewhat narrower than I wanted to make them. And even so, we end up with taking out six feet that cannot be used for anything else. But it's only over a short distance. And this has the effect of narrowing the bench work in a few places while leaving other areas much wider. Of course, while I am working on this area, I have to be considering all three decks at the same time. So here are the others. Here's what it does to the middle deck. We've had to pinch this bench work at this point down to the bare minimum. I've drawn it at about seven inches wide although it could even be an inch or two less than that. It's all going to depend on how much the customer wants to squeeze the aisle when he actually builds the layout, because at this point every inch counts. And we'll notice in the harbour area that this benchwork along here has been narrowed down slightly. Originally I drew everything at a nominal three feet wide because the client wanted to allow for big scenes and full-size industries. And then for the lower deck, this is what I drew. Here we can see what those three white bars on the walkway are for. Because with the helix being unwrapped at the bottom and running down hidden under the scenery and into the turn back curve under the walkway, obviously we need to have some kind of emergency access, not only for maintenance of the track, but just in case a train derails or anything like that. And it's probably not going to be convenient to get in under the walkway from the side. So that's why I suggested these overhead access panels. And I'm thinking they would just be attached with piano hinges along the outside edges. And then drill a one inch diameter finger hole near the middle of the front, just to make it easy to lift it up and then put it back down again afterwards. We probably also want magnetic catches along the front edge, just to avoid any possibility of the flat being left slightly up and becoming a tripping hazard. You want to make sure that it seats down properly each time. Now after the basic shape of the stair area was determined, we did a few little adjustments, moving boundaries an inch or two here and there, but this basic shape remained until the end of the plan. Now this is the bottom level plan, which is mainly for staging, but the main staging yard in this area, wrapped around the end to allow for some longer trains, the reversing loops under each helix that I told you about last time, possibility of auxiliary staging under the mine branch, and then this area around here, which is a low level scenic area, allowing for one extra full length passing siding on the Norfolk and Southern Main Line. Now the changes I made at this point were to abandon the mine that was down here and to add a pulpwood and wood chip loading area instead. There are already three mines on the middle deck, so we don't really need another one down here since the slab isn't predominantly a coal hauling railroad. So it gives an interesting opportunity for an abandoned rusty structure and then the mainline turnout would have been removed and the rest of the track would now be derelict. 
to replace it, we have a working industry at the other end of the siding. And originally it was just going to be a simple pulpwood loading spur. But then I remembered a story in Model Railroader several decades ago, where they had a look at a wood chip loading area. And it just had two tracks diverging from the main line running under a wood chip loader. And the rationale behind this variation of it is that they started out as a pulpwood dealer and then added the wood chip loading area later to avoid wastage. So any logs that arrive at the area either too short or that otherwise don't meet their standards for resale, they can just run it through the wood chipper and sell it in wood chip form. And at this point, we'd already decided that the upper deck was going to have a paper mill and we thought that one product or the other would go to that paper mill and the other one would be sold to a different paper mill off stage so it would go to staging. That was before I discovered that some mills buy wood chips, pulpwood and full-size logs all interchangeably. And I don't know why that is. Maybe it's so they can follow the markets or whatever it is most economical at the time. I guess that's somewhere I need to do more research on. So that's all on the lower deck for now. Let's go to the middle. Here's how the middle deck is developing. We've now decided that the harbour area is actually going to be switched by a different railroad from the short line that does the upper deck. So we now have two short lines interchanging at the one yard. So I've drawn the three companies trackage with different colours of ballast just to keep them separate. Now when I started fleshing out the main yard, I knew that one of the industries the client wanted was an auto rack loading ramp. And at this stage, it was suggested that we put it on this branch line instead of in the main yard. And there is, after all, plenty of space for it here, along with a, a second possible industry that hasn't been determined yet. So this will be a second switching area en route to the harbour. Now, I also wanted to give all three railroads an industry to switch at this junction. So we have the harbour belt, which is the grey line, having an industry here beside their interchange yard. We have the brown line, which I just called short line, with an industry in this area that's otherwise unused near the backdrop. And there's a nice large space inside the turnback curve for an industry to be switched by the Norfolk and Southern. And I suggested a scrap yard because it's an awkward shape and we don't really want to have any tall structures to reach over because this is the main yard ladder where all the switching is going to be done. When I presented this version to the client, he liked most of it but did have one reservation. There is no provision for locomotive servicing. Now that wasn't in the original specifications because at the time, it was assumed that this was just going to be a very minor location where the only thing of importance to the Norfolk and Southern was the interchange with the short line. But now that we have two short lines interchanging here and two mine branches in the vicinity, it's starting to make this yard more and more important and therefore it's likely that we're going to need a pool of locomotives to do the mine runs. Now we asked about the possibility of moving this curve, making the scrapyard smaller, and putting it on the outside. But this leads to one of the repercussions with going for such a large mainline radius. The main line around here is 42 inch radius with 44 and an eighth on the yard lead behind it. And we can see that it uses up most of the width of the benchwork on both sides of the aisle. So in order to get more space here, we either have to move it right to the wall at this point when there's no room for the short line to pass behind it, or we've got to make the curve smaller, or we've got to find more space in this area. Now, since we are using nominally one half of a workshop building, and this wall has not yet been built, I suggested adding an alcove in this corner. So let me see if I can find that drawing. This illustrates what I meant. We have an alcove about two feet by 12 in this corner, so that the main line can now move to the front of the benchwork, and then head into and out of the alcove. Note at this point that I have not realigned the benchwork edge or the backdrop. They are shown in their original locations just for reference. And we can see the size of the area behind it, this green rectangle, we end up with about an extra 18 inches or so that we can use not only for locomotive refueling, but also a rip track, maybe maintenance of waste storage yard and stuff like that. Now the client's response to this was, instead of building a 2 by 12 alcove in this corner, let's just move the whole wall two feet and then give us more space in the rest of the room as well. So now the 30 foot width has become a 32 foot width. 
And although there is a limit to how much we can gain on the top deck because of the truss locations, it certainly made a huge difference in this last bay, not only on this level, but also on the staging level as well. So let's move on to that next. This is the next iteration of the staging level with the room now two feet wider. As you can see, I have drawn the entire staging yard in full detail with proper turnouts instead of just leaving space for it. The area along this wall has now got a little bit longer. and We've now added a dispatcher desk in this corner under the middle level bench work. And then the cutout in the aisle here allows the seated dispatcher to be out of the way of the other operators. And also this cutout allows for better access to the scenery in this area. It makes it a lot easier on reach. Now I found that I was able to get 11 tracks curved around the end without violating the three foot minimum radius. And then the tracks in the middle are just shorter staging tracks for local trains and for the Amtrak trains as well. There are seven tracks in the 15 to 18 foot range and 11 in the 27 to 40 foot range. Now here is the middle deck utilizing the extra space. There's now room to make the bench work a little bit wider in both cases. So we now have some background scenery behind the yard and much deeper scenery in the mountains. And the main aisle has gone back from 42 inches to 48, like it was in one of the earlier plans. In this view, we can see a lot more development in the yard area. I've used number 10 turnouts on the main line and a mixture of sevens and eights in the yard. And we now actually have two yards. We've got East Yard, which is the main yard, and we've got West Yard, which is an interchange with the Harbour Belt Railroad. And we've still got the two interchange tracks behind East Yard for the short line that serves the upper level. And here is the main reason for the adjustment. We've got all this space in this corner. I've put in two locomotive fueling tracks, one rip track, and two maintenance of waste storage tracks. I also figured this was a good spot for a small industry in the back, and I suggested a propane dealer because it could fit into a confined space such as we've got between the Norfolk and Southern and the short line. We've now got two industries for the short line to switch at this point, while the Norfolk and Southern has three industries and a team track to switch. All of these are, of course, on the other side of the main line. So the switch crew will have to talk to the dispatcher and make sure it's clear before switching these industries. And I put a second crossover at this point so that he doesn't have to foul the main line for quite as long. One of the other benefits with having more space in this area was that the bench work at this point got wider and there was now a much wider area for the Amtrak station. And we figured it could also be a Greyhound station where his passenger trains interchange with long distance buses as well. And he liked that idea. The mine branches have now both been filled in properly. The one around the north and east walls now actually has two mines on it, a small one in the corner and a much larger one at the end. And by having it on a downgrade, losing about four inches of elevation, we can have the tail tracks for the large mine extend underneath the benchwork on the other side for a lot more capacity. He wanted to be able to run a fairly long unit train of large capacity coal gondolas. I think they're Bethgons, although that might be a term for something different, I'm not quite sure. And this view also shows how the tail track for the mine branch can extend behind the mine into a hidden staging track. So this branch can now serve an additional train. And although I didn't actually draw it here, I mentioned in the write-up that there was room for two or three storage tracks in this area, not just the one. To which his response was, can we possibly hook it up with the helix and go all the way down to staging? And at first I wasn't quite sure if the elevations were gonna work, but as we'll see later, it turned out that it was perfectly feasible to join this tail track up with the helix. At one point I was thinking that I might have enough grade distance from here along the wall and back again to get down to staging without a helix at all, but it turned out that I did actually need one lap in this corner. And since we have the minimum visible curve set for a wider radius than the hidden curves, we needed to angle this benchwork out further than would be necessary just for the helix. So I've been able to elongate it slightly, gain even more height in a single lap, and also where well, the helix passes under the coal branch, we've got nearly a foot of separation. So the scenery in this area is not restricted as it usually is above a helix. There is still plenty of depth available to have a river valley in this area without getting in the way of the hidden track below. 
there were still a few things that needed improving with this plan. For one, I wasn't sure that the capacity of this interchange yard was going to be sufficient because the tracks are relatively short. And I thought I'd also be able to get a longer run round track for the Harbour Belt Railroad by cutting a curved switch into the easement at this point instead of starting the run round track all back here. I was also wondering whether it would be beneficial to have the ladder for the utility tracks in this corner come the other way and cross the lead to this other interchange yard. So the next iteration showed all these changes. At this location, a few minor alterations greatly improved the situation. We now have a much longer run round track for the short line. We have four interchange tracks instead of three. So we now have a better capacity in this interchange yard. The two tracks for the short line interchange also grew in length slightly as I rearranged this area. And we can see an alternative arrangement for the tracks in this area. But when I showed this to the customer, he agreed with me that he didn't really like it as much as the other one. Note how I didn't even take the turnout out. Because as I started drawing this, I really wasn't liking the way that it was fitting. And it was no surprise to me at all when the client requested we went back to the original version. But also you can see in this area, I've got a three track staging yard on the coal branch which runs downhill and hooks up with the helix at this point. The average grade from this junction to the back of the mine is only about one and a half percent. So even less than the ruling maximum that we set out to achieve earlier. At both ends, I've arranged the turnouts where they can be most easily accessible. At this end, they are right at the front where they are accessible under the fascia. And at this point, it'll be a removable chunk of scenery between the two main lines. And although it may look as though it's obstructed by the short line, there's a height difference here of about 10 or 11 inches. So really it's not going to be in the way. And then the two front tracks are both about 28 feet long and the rear one is around 32 feet. So plenty long enough for decent length cold drags on the branch line. Now the next thing we did was to start working on the harbour area, which is the only area on the middle deck that we still hadn't worked on at all. This was the first version that I came up with. And I must admit, I kind of goofed up here. And I totally forgot that the client had asked for his major industry here to be a bulk transfer from rail to water. Although at this stage, he hadn't yet confirmed what kind of commodity he wanted to transfer. So when I asked that question, he sent me some possibilities. And the one that we both picked out was a grain transfer facility. Although one feature he did like about this plan was the sneak off track between the buildings into a staging area behind the backdrop. Not only does this greatly increase the traffic capacity of the short line without cramping the harbour area, but it also means that the locomotive facilities for this line can be off stage and therefore we don't need to model them. After all, we have to model full locomotive facilities for the short line on the upper deck and we've got engine refueling for the Norfolk and Southern at the interchange yard. So having a third locomotive servicing facility was really well down on the priority list at this point. Now we ended up with two bulk transfer facilities. Let me show you on the next plan. The area in the front is fairly closely based on an industry that was actually number 11 of those that he sent us. So we've referred to it as Harbour Facility number 11. And it was a bulk grain transfer. And then we have another more conventional grain elevator in the back with conveyors leading off stage, suggesting that there is another berth further back in the aisle. I also showed a short spur to a scrap metal wharf. And then clearly there's going to be room for some more industries in this area, although we don't yet know what. Anyway, he liked this basic design. There are some problems with it. This industry at the front is very much distorted because I couldn't get a decent sized storage silo between the railroad spur and the river. So we looked at the possibility of reducing the number of tracks in the yard which serves the grain elevator. And we came to the conclusion that we didn't really need this front run round track because the back track of the yard needs to be kept open as a thoroughfare track anyway to switch the elevator. So that can also be used as a locomotive release for arriving trains. That gives us an extra two inches which may make all the difference at this point. These silos are still going to be significantly smaller than they are on the prototype, but we can probably get a much closer rendition of it than we had previously. I would very much like to show photos of the facility that I worked from, but I'm not quite sure if they're copyrighted and I really don't want to risk a copyright strike on my channel. So maybe I should just put a link in the description below if I remember to do so. 
So now let's move on to the next iteration. Here we see it taking shape a lot better. By eliminating that one track in the front, we've now got a little bit more space between the first track and the water, so there is now space to more closely follow the general arrangement of the prototype facility, even though the storage silos are still much smaller than they should be. Based on my estimations from the photographs, I'm thinking they should be at least a foot in diameter. I also rearranged the turnouts in this area and inserted one rail surf industry in the back area. Originally, I was going to have it served by two spurs, but then I decided to have the first one just heading out of sight behind the grain elevator. My rationale is that it used to serve one or more other industries further down there, but now that they've gone over to road transportation, this now just serves as an extra track for storing grain hoppers and generally giving you more room while switching the area. The customer asked if there was room for a modern cannery industry on the other side of the aisle. And with the existing benchwork edge, there is room for a long, narrow building with a spur behind it and just a little bit of wharf in front. But since it's the end of an aisle, we can widen the benchwork slightly if we need to. There'll still be plenty of room for operators in the area. So the customer responded by sending me photographs of a lot of up-to-date cannery areas and asked about the possibility of an L-shaped structure partially on legs over the water. So this is what we ended up with. We've now got a little more water and some more space for a bigger building. Now the rail siding along the rear, we're assuming is mainly going to be for delivery of packaging materials. But we're also assuming that the fish oil is going to be collected and stored in these storage tanks at the rear of the building. And there'll occasionally be a tent car spotted here to ship that out as well. Although most of the fish will go out by truck. There's no reason why we can't have the occasional refrigerator car pull in here for long distance shipments. But we're assuming that most of it is going to go by road. And of course, there may well be private customers that come in, park their cars in this area and just buy fish directly from the wharf. So now with all the switching areas on the two lower decks nicely taking shape, it's now time to start filling in details. So here is the lower deck with the scenery and other details filled in. There has been one change to the track in this area. We talked about a crossover halfway along this passing siding. We weren't sure if we were going to switch this area with a short local turn from the main yard or not. And if we did that, we would probably want a shorter run round so he doesn't have to run the full length of passing side in the back again. But on the other hand, if we're going to switch it with the local freight in one direction only, we don't need that crossover. We just make sure that the cars for this industry are near the front of the train. Now scenic wise, we have this area winding along a river valley. And although this is commonly done, often the river is just squeezed in right at the front like it is here. Around the end curve, because of the desire to keep to a 42 inch radius on the visible curve, we ended up fairly close to the back of the scene, which means there is now a lot of space in the front to do a good job of the river meandering its way along in front of the railroad, not following it so closely. And note how it comes well away from the track at this point. That's because of the post that we need to support the truss being in front of the backdrop. So we need a tall rocky outcrop to hide it. So I've moved the river all the way forward. So now we can have the track boring through a short rock tunnel. So moving on to the middle deck. Here is the middle deck with all the scenery and structures filled in. There are a couple of things that changed later on. We have here the remains of an industry that is no longer rail served, just because that period in time, a lot of formerly rail served industries would have been going over to road transportation. So we thought we'd have another spur here with the turnout having been removed. Later, we decided to put a trailer on flat tire facility in this area. And also at the end of the aisle, the public road that serves the propane dealer runs between the two main lines and then crosses on a grade crossing and we'll have the start of a small town. Now, I didn't want to put a grade crossing any further up the yard lead because of the need to frequently block it. So that's why I had the road curve all the way around the end. And it seemed fairly forced and we both decided we didn't like it. And it was much better to have the public road climb a grade and then cross over the Norfolk and Southern on a bridge. And that gave us a much better alignment and a better space for the town. Now, the last thing I wanted to point out before I sign off is the various curve radii. We've already mentioned the 42 inch minimum on the Norfolk and Southern main line. So this is 42 inches over this trestle. This is 42 inches around here. 
and this curve around the outside of the river is 42 inch radius. Everything else is significantly larger. This of course leads us to a wide area of bench work in here, which is probably more than we could usefully use, which is why the backdrop does not attempt to make use of the area above the helix. We may as well just leave full standard access in here. Now the main mine branch also has a minimum radius of three foot, the same as the hidden trackage for the Norfolk and Southern, because now that it continues further, we may decide that we want to run six axle locomotives around here instead of just treating it as a local run. Also, the main short line has a minimum main line radius of three foot. The other mining branch, on the other hand, I've deliberately gone a little bit sharper in this corner. Not only did it improve the scenery at this point, but it gives us a good excuse to restrict this branch to four axle diesels. And since we now have a small pool of those stored at this yard, we're covered in that respect. And we also thought that we could possibly have a Norfolk and Southern grain train having trackage rights on the harbour branch. Note the connection here allows for that if necessary. So supposing a grain train arrives at this yard, half of the train would be left on one of the longer tracks in East Yard, and the other half would continue onto the harbour where it would switch this area and return to the yard before coming back with the other half of the train. Now I've already mentioned that some of the curves in this area are slightly less than three foot radius. And although most model six axle diesels will quite satisfactorily perform on those curves, we have the opportunity for an operating wrinkle requiring that this branch be restricted to four axle diesels only, thus making it a lot more interesting. Now, even before I start editing this video, I know it's gonna be really long, so I'm not going to attempt to discuss the upper deck. I'm gonna leave that for a future installment. So I'm just going to sign off here. I'll just give you one more look at the lower deck. Feel free to pause the video here if you want to. If you would like to see a cross section through the entire layout, showing how all the levels fit together, please feel free to go back to last week's installment where I showed the cross section right at the end of that video. And I'm going to sign off for now. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation and I hope to see you again next week. Thanks for watching and bye for now.